Hey, everybody, and welcome to week nine of Socratic Med's 15-week uh, MCAT supplement course. Um, today, we're just going to be talking a little bit about operons, post-transcriptional control, and cancer. Um, so my name is Chris. Um, we are Socratic Med, just a little bit about us. We're a grassroots nonprofit, um, and we provide sensible solutions to students with disparate medical school opportunities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so our Instagram handle is over there at Socratic Med underscore. You could take a look over there. Um, I listed some other, um, you know, some other useful links that you could take a look at. Uh, the office hour sign up at the bottom is a link tree um, that actually has all of the links that you need. So anything um, you see here, as well as some other links, um, you can sign up for our office hours. Um, uh, you could get the group meet from there. You could see our website. Um, so you can check that out uh, if you're interested. Um, and just on a more personal note before we begin, my name is Chris. I graduated from Stony Brook. Um, in May of 2019 on a pre-med track, um, and I finished with a BS in Applied Math and Statistics. So I took the MCAT in April of 2021, and I scored a 520, which was the 97th percentile, um, and I got a perfect score on the psych and social section. So because of that, my, uh, my tutoring specialties are usually biology, psych, and sociology. Okay, so we're just going to dive right into it. So we're going to start, uh, and we're just going to review really quickly the central dogma. Um, this should definitely be review. I mean, I hope at this point you guys are familiar with it, but we're definitely going to go over it because you really should know it for the test. Um, so DNA, RNA, protein. So it starts with DNA. Eukaryotic DNA is double-stranded. It's um, a molecule that does not leave the nucleus. It's very important, so it stays sequestered in the nucleus. Um, in order to shuttle this information to the ribosomes uh, for translation of proteins in the cytoplasm and the rough ER, because that's where our ribosomes are located, um, enzymes in the nucleus create a single-stranded RNA molecule um, in a process that's known as transcription, um, and that undergoes further modifications and it eventually makes its way to the ribosome. Um, so the ribosomes then translate the mRNA's nucleic acid sequence into an amino acid sequence to create a polypeptide, and that process is known as translation. So that was just a quick review of the central dogma. It um, goes from DNA to RNA to protein. So for going from DNA to RNA is known as transcription. Going from RNA to protein is known as translation. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about those two. Um, so... From nucleic acids to amino acids, the genetic code is the unambiguous code that ribosomes use to translate four nucleotides into 20 amino acids. So if you look over to the right, um, this is known as the genetic code. There are 64 combinations, um, 61 of them code for actual amino acids, and then three of them are what is known as a stop codon. Um, so the four nucleotides that we find here um, and you know, throughout DNA are adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Um, so in RNA, the nucleotides are actually adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. Um, thymine is not present in RNA, it's uracil that actually pairs with adenine. Um, and it, it's important to note that it, it pairs during transcription, but RNA is a single-stranded uh, molecule, whereas DNA is double-stranded, so DNA is always paired. Um, RNA, the pairing is really used for uh, replication. Um, excuse me, the pairing is used for transcription. Uh, during translation, words containing three nucleotides known as codons are used to decide which amino acid um, is to be added uh, to the elongating polypeptide. So like I said before, there are 64 possible combinations. Um, a lot of times, if the first two of the three letters are the same, um, it will remain the same. The, the, the amino acid that is produced will remain the same. Um, that's not always the case, but that's just, you know, something that I wanted to throw out there. That's usually something useful to know. Um, and then three of them are stop codons, which means once, um, once that sequence, once that codon is registered, um, it's sort of like a termination signal for the poly, for, um, for transcription. I'm sorry, translation. Um, so like I was saying, there are 64 possible codons, 61 of them code for amino acids, and three of them are known as stop codons, and we also call them nonsense codons, um, because they don't code. They're not actually coding, they're just there to send a signal to stop uh, creating that polypeptide. So different codons that code for the same amino acid are known as synonyms. So uh, if we take a look at this code, say we look at this first box all the way up to the top left, um, you have UUU and UUC. Both of those are coding for phenylalanine, um, so they would be considered synonyms. So because a specific codon will always code for the same amino acid, the genetic code is said to have no ambiguity. It's unambiguous, um, which is a pretty important concept also to understand. Um, so if we look at phenylalanine again, for example, there are two different 
codons that will code for phenylalanine. However, each one of those codons will only ever code for phenylalanine. So we can have multiple codons that lead to the same amino acid, but that singular codon is always going to code for the same amino acid every single time. So that's why we say that the code is set to be unambiguous, it doesn't have any ambiguity. Um, and then there, there are some exceptions to the central dogma. So for example, retroviruses uh, utilize an enzyme known as reverse transcriptase um, to go against the dogma and create DNA from RNA. Um, so like I mentioned before, this is the 15 week supplement course. So a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here, we did go over um, the original course. Uh, we do have a 15 week MCAT prep course. Uh, it's for free. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on our website. Um, so I, I did speak in one of the virology lessons about reverse transcriptase and the lysogenic cycle. Um, so that would be, that's the most common example of how, um, you know, certain organisms or certain viruses can actually defy the central dogma. Okay, so this brings us to the first question. Um, just take about a minute. Um, it's a pretty simple question. I just wanna make sure that everybody is comfortable reading that, uh, that code and that chart. So which of the following codons will no longer produce the same amino acid after its third letter has been changed from C to A? So pause the video, uh, take a minute, um, and we will go over it. Okay, which of the following codons will no longer produce the same amino acid after its third letter has been changed from C to A? So the correct answer is A, um, and that would be UAC. So it really just comes down to looking over here. Um, you just have to look and see which, you know, which codon is producing a change. Um, it's not gonna produce the same amino acid. So UAC, if we change that UAC to UAA, let me find that UAC. If we change that C right over here in this top third box to an A, um, it's no longer coding for tyrosine, it's becoming a stop codon. So um, that mutation would actually be heard, that wouldn't be silent. Um, so that's why UAC is the correct answer. And B, C, and D are incorrect, just because if we're changing the C to the A on B, C, and D, these answer choices, they're going to code for the same amino acid. So We'll just look at one of them, and then if you guys would like, you can definitely go back and look at yourself. But C U C. Um, so we have our first letter C. Second letter is U. So then that brings us right over here. So if we change the C to an A, um, it's still coding for leucine. So there really hasn't been a change, and that is the case with all of these answers except for A. Okay. Um, so post transcriptional control. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about transcription in prokaryotes first, and then we'll compare it to uh, eukaryotic transcription. Uh, so in bacteria, all transcription occurs in an RNA polymerase enzyme complex consisting of five subunits. So bacteria, um, humans have a couple of different RNA polymerases. Uh, bacteria just has this one complex. Um, and like I said, it consists of five subunits. Um, I don't think it's super important to know all of the um, just to know all the names of the subunits. But I, I would say it is important to understand what the sigma factor is. Um, and that's basically an additional subunit that this complex has to associate with before it becomes active. So once that sigma factor associates with the RNA polymerase complex, um, it becomes active and it can, start, um, it can start polymerizing. So transcription consists of three phases, initiation, elongation, and termination. So uh, we'll just go over each of them individually. Uh, the first, obviously, is initiation. Um, and during initiation, RNA polymerase scans the prokaryotic DNA until it finds a promoter sequence. So recall that a promoter is a DNA sequence at which an enzyme can attach to initiate transcription. So that's just uh, the starting point, pretty much, for um, for RNA polymerase to attach and then uh, begin transcription. So in bacteria, there are two primary sequences found in promoters. Um, and that's really what promoters are. They're just specific sequences that allow um, these enzymes to attach to the DNA so they could start transcription. So those two primary sequences are known as the PRIVNO box and the 35 sequence. Um, again, the name's not super important, but you should definitely just understand uh, what a promoter is and why it's important. So once the promoter is located, the enzyme and the DNA form what is known as a closed complex. RNA polymerase then unwinds and separates the small portion of the double-stranded DNA. Uh, the single-stranded sequence and the enzyme together are known as the open complex. So once we switch from the closed complex to the open complex, we're going to start to move towards elongation, which is our second step. So after the open complex is formed, elongation begins and the sigma factor dissociates from the RNA polymerase complex. As its primary function, 
primary functions are to increase the enzyme's ability to recognize promoters and to decrease the nonspecific affinity for DNA of the enzyme. So the, the sigma factor that we were talking about on the last slide is super important um, for you know, RNA polymerase to find the promoter, but once it finds that promoter, the sigma factor dissociates and we don't really need it anymore. So RNA polymerase moves down the bacterial DNA in what is known as a transcription bubble. Um, and that's kind of what you're seeing um, right over here. This isn't the greatest graphic to see the transcription bubble, but it's it, it, it's evident enough right here. It's called a bubble because it's just a small section where the DNA is unwound and separated. So it appears like it's a bubble. Um, and it just, that's how uh, DNA, uh, RNA polymerase moves down the strand of DNA. So one polymerase complex will synthesize the entire RNA molecule. Okay, and then finally termination. So after elongation, termination begins um, when the complex receives a termination signal, often with the help of a protein row. Um, that's really all you need to know about the protein row. It's just a termination signal that um, aids in the switch from elongation to termination um, in prokaryotes. Um, so when the signal is received, the complex falls off the DNA and releases the newly synthesized RNA molecule. And that transcription bubble on the DNA closes and the RNA polymerase will repeat the cycle, again, starting with the association of the complex with another sigma factor. Because remember, it's an enzyme, um, so it's not used up in the reaction, uh, but it does need to find another sigma factor before it can find that promoter um, and start transcribing again. And we're going to switch over uh, and start talking about eukaryotic transcription and modification. So as we did mention before, eukaryotic transcription takes place in the nucleus. Um, so remember, prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. That's why they're prokaryotic. Uh, so transcription and translation can occur simultaneously. That does not happen in eukaryotes. Um, our transcription is in the nucleus and translation occurs in the cytoplasm. Um, so during transcription, eukaryotes produce an mRNA precursor known as HNRNA. This HNRNA will be extensively modified in the nucleus before leaving as mRNA. So that's another difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes is that um, immediately following prokaryotic transcription, um, that molecule is, an, is a mature mRNA molecule and it is completely ready for translation. Um, when we're talking about eukaryotes, it's a little bit different of a story. The first, the primary transcript is HNRNA, which is just a very long version of mRNA that needs to be cut is pretty much what it is. It just needs to be cut and modified before it leaves. So the hRNA contains many non-coding se non -coding sequences, which are known as introns. Um, and between those, uh, there are sequences that actually do code for the proteins, and those are known as exons. Um, and the RNA strand will undergo splicing in the nucleus. So the spliceosome is a complex made of proteins and catalytic uh, RNA molecules known as snRNA molecules. Um, so spliceosomes are not pre-assembled, but assemble spontaneously around the individual intron that needs to be removed. So intron, we said, is that not coding, um, that non-coding, uh, those sequences. So the spliceosomes actually form around those introns and remove them. So that's part of the, the alternative splicing um, that takes HNRNA and turns it into a mature mRNA. So this post-transcriptional RNA modification is so powerful because a single HNRNA can be spliced into multiple different ways. Um, and that creates a different final mRNA products and eventually different protein products. So that's something that's um, that eukaryotes do, prokaryotes don't do it. This is known as alternative splicing. So we can have multiple protein products coming from the same gene. Um, so that does make it a very powerful tool and it makes it really efficient because we can get much more protein products um, but we don't have to increase the amount of mRNA or um, the amount of genes that we have to express. Um, so more modification, once the RNA molecule has been spliced, it undergoes further modification before leaving the nucleus. The HNRNA will acquire a methylated guanine nucleotide on its five end, um, and that's known as the five prime cap. Um, it's either known as the five prime cap, sometimes I've heard it called a guanine cap, um, and on the other side, it's also going to acquire a string of several hundred adenine nucleotides on its three prime end, and that's known as the three prime poly A tail, or simply the poly A tail. So both the cap and tail are essential for preventing the mRNA's degradation by exonucleases when it leaves uh, the nucleus for translation. So it leaves, um, there are these exonucleases that are kind of floating around in the cytoplasm, and their job is to degrade RNA. Um, 
so this three prime poly A tail and the five prime guanine cap actually prevents these exonucleases from destroying them before they can get to translation. So th those are super important um, because without them, we wouldn't have protein production. So which of the following is true regarding post-transcriptional modification in prokaryotes? Take a minute, uh, pause your video, and we will go over it. Okay, which of the following is true regarding post-transcriptional modification in prokaryotes? So the correct answer is C, the sigma factor associated with RNA polymerase will detach during elongation. So let's go over it. A, uh, the hRNA produced must be extensively modified before it can be translated into proteins. So that is true um, for eukaryotes. So you have to remember that prokaryotes, the primary transcript after transcription, there's mRNA. They don't do alternative splicing. Um, they don't have this immature form of RNA that eukaryotes do called hnRNA. Um, so if we were talking about eukaryotes, that would definitely be true, but um, prokaryotes, it does not occur. Spliceosomes are assembled spontaneously around the intron. They are removing. Again, that would definitely be true for eukaryotes, but we don't, we don't see alternative splicing in prokaryotes, so there is no spliceosome. So B would also be incorrect. Um, D says RNA polymerase in prokaryotes moves down the DNA in what is known as a replication fork. Um, it doesn't. It moves down in what is known as a transcription bubble. Replication fork would obviously be for replication. So the only true answer is going to be C. The sigma factor associated with RNA polymerase will detach during elongation, which is true, like we just spoke about. Remember, when it starts elongation, it does not need the sigma factor anymore. So the sigma factor dissociates, um, and it won't associate with it again until it needs to um, attach to a new DNA molecule. And if you have any questions about this, um, please, you can always send me an email. I put my email at the end of every um, every lecture. So please feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions or you know you need help with anything. So control gene expression and operons. So the expression of genes can be regulated in many ways. Um, one, one, of, one of which is by modifying DNA, that should say, excuse me, DNA methylation is a process in which methyl groups are added to DNA to turn off expression in eukaryotes. So methylation can physically block the gene from transcriptional proteins, meaning um, that actual methyl group that's on it can block RNA um, and other proteins from actually attaching and being able to read it. Um, and it can also recruit proteins to change its winding patterns around histones. So histones are the little proteins that uh, DNA is wrapped around. Um, and we use methylation to actually affect those winding patterns. If things are more tightly packed, um, your body's going to have a much harder time reading it. So that, those are the two mechanisms uh, by which DNA methylation works. Uh, genomic imprinting is another uh, type of gene expression control, um, and that's when only a single allele is expressed for a particular gene. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that this is an epigenetic process. Epigenetic um, sort of means above genetic. Um, it can be different from generation to generation. So it's not it's not something that you can you can pass you can pass on. So if you have a gene um, that is imprinted in you, for example, your offspring may not have that same imprint. Um, it's epigenetic. Um, their you know their grandkid or their great grandchild may um, you know may have the same sort of genomic imprinting that you do, um, but it's not guaranteed because it's not passed genetically. It's epigenetic. Uh, so the lac operon is almost definitely going to going to appear on the MCAT. Um, so it's really important that you understand it. It's not super hard conceptually, um, but sometimes when you look at the picture and you don't understand what you're looking at, it can be kind of scary. So we're just going to summarize all of it. Uh, we're going to go over some of the important terms, and then um, we'll try to apply it to a question or two. So in prokaryotes, regulation of transcription is the primary method of regulation of gene expression. So the lac operon is a regulatory mechanism employed by bacteria to control its production of uh, this enzyme called beta-galactosidase, and that's based on the presence of lactose. Um, so we say that the lac operon is considered inducible because the product will not be transcribed until the presence of lactose induces its production. So operons can be either inducible or repressible. Um, so inducible means the default state is off, um, and we have to induce it to turn it on. <clears throat> so it's basically, it's basically the lac operon is just the way that bacteria 
um, can efficiently regulate the production of certain enzymes because um, they need the beta galactosidase to break down lactose. But if there's no lactose in the environment, then it doesn't really make sense to be producing this because it uses a lot of ATP. So uh, they've developed this sort of uh, negative feedback mechanism um, and it's very efficient and it's very energy saving. So the lac operon consists of five components along with two other genes that are located at a distant site. And when I say distant site, I mean um, like in terms of proximity, actual distance. So the lac operon um, are a bunch of genes that are together although it is affected by a couple of other genes that are somewhere else, that are located somewhere else in the genome that are not actually close to it. So um, starting with one, the P region is the promoter for the transcription of the Z, Y, and A genes, which we're going to go over in a second. Remember, the promoter is just a sequence where um, enzymes can attach. So if um, we're talking about transcription in this case, the, the promoter is responsible for attaching um, that enzyme. Uh, two, the O region is the operator site where the lac repressor protein can bind. So operators are really where um, like activators and repressors bind. So in this case, we have a lac repressor protein that binds to the O region. Um, three is the Z gene, and that codes for the actual enzyme, the beta galactosidase. Four is the Y gene, which codes for another enzyme known as permease, and that allows uh, inward lactose transport into the cell. Um, five is the A gene, which codes for transacetylase, which is an enzyme that transfers acetyl groups from acetyl-CoA to beta-galactosides, um, which it, the A gene is actually not, um, it's not required for um, beta-galactosidase activity, um, but it is part of the lac operon. Um, so those are the three main uh, gene products that come from this operon and that allow the bacteria to uh, make use of lactose if there's lactose present in the environment. Um, the CRP gene is a distant gene that codes uh, for the catabolite activator protein, which we just call CAP, um, and it helps couple the lac operon with glucose levels in the cell. So at the most basic level, the lac operon responds to uh, the presence of lactose, but it also responds to the presence or absence of glucose, and uh, the CAP protein, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, um, does that. The I gene is also a distant gene that codes for the lac repressor protein, so we can't forget that. Um, it creates the repressor protein and then based on um, a certain condition, which we'll talk about in a minute as well, it will bind um, to the O region or not bind to the O region. So both glucose and lactose levels affect the lac operon. In general, an absence of glucose and the presence of lactose will result in transcription of the lac operon's gene products. So the presence of glucose in the cell inactivates uh, this enzyme called adenyl cyclase, which in turn lowers the levels of CAMP in the cell. So uh, whenever we're talking about cell growth, um, adenyl cyclase and CAMP always come up. Uh, signal transduction, we've talked about them as well. So th it pops up a lot um, when we're talking about stuff like this. Um, in this case, though, CAP that we were just talking about actually has the complex with CAMP to bind to the promoter of the lac operon and activate RNA polymerase. So that's how the RNA polymerase is activated. So high glucose concentration means low CAP-CAMP complexing and low transcription rates and vice versa. If we have low glucose concentration, we're going to have higher CAP-CAMP complexing, and then we're going to have higher transcription rates. So the absence or presence of lactose will also affect the operon. When lactose is not present in the cell, the repressor protein remains bound to the operator, um, and transcription cannot occur, regardless of glucose levels. So if you look at this graphic to the right, um, in any of these situations where there is no lactose, you see this uh, repressor protein is bound to the operon. So it doesn't matter how much or how little glucose is in the environment. If this repressor protein is on here, then there's no way that we're going to be able to transcribe this. So um, the way it works, uh, lactose acts as an allosteric inhibitor for the repressor protein. So this is sort of like the simple uh, negative feedback mechanism. So when lactose is pregnant, uh, when lactose is present, excuse me, it induces a conformational change in the repressor protein, and that causes it to fall off of the operon and it allows transcription. So um, the repressor protein is on, that's our default. Once lactose is present, it's going to find its way to the repressor protein, it's going to bind to it, and it's going to change its shape, and then the repressor is going to fall off, and it's going to allow for more transcription. So the trip operon is a lot simpler than the lac operon, um, and the lac operon is usually one that we see more often, but definitely you should understand the trip operon as well. This is pretty much just um, just like a basic feedback mechanism. With the lac operon, we were talking about glucose levels and lactose levels, um, but this is pretty much just dependent on, on uh, the concentration of one specific um, substance. And in this case, it's tryptophan. So another bacterial operon of interest is known as the trip operon. 
and the chirp operon is a repressible one, whereas the lack operon was inducible because its default is to stay active until it's repressed. So the lack operon is off until we turn it on. The trip operon is on until we turn it off. So bacteria use the genes in the trip operon to create five enzymes that convert charismic acid into the amino acid tryptophan. Um, and just like LAC, the, the LAC operon, we only really need to do this when, we, when the bacterial cell doesn't have tryptophan. So it's devised a way to you know, efficiently create tryptophan when it needs it. And that is the trip operon, which uh, is driven by the presence or absence of tryptophan. So the genes in the operon will be transcribed unless there's a high amount of tryptophan in the cell. So when tryptophan is present, it binds to the trip repressor protein and then binds to the operon's operator to inhibit the transcription. If there's no tryptophan in the cell, the repressor protein cannot bind and the transcription of the trip genes can proceed as normal. So this is a lot simpler. Um, it's going to it's just going to, you know, keep on transcribing. It's going to be making uh, those enzymes to to form tryptophan. Um, but if we have a high enough amount of tryptophan in the cell, then there's no reason to be doing this. Um, it binds to that repressor protein, um, um, and it, it inhibits transcription because we already have tryptophan in the cell. All right, we're just about finished with today's video. I just wanted to go over a couple of slides um, about cancer. It's not super high yield on the MCAT, um, but you definitely should know it um, because it does pop up. And again, it, a lot of times you'll see it in the context of a passage or something like that, but it's always good to have uh, background knowledge. Okay, so oncogenes and tumor suppressors. Cancer is an inappropriate cell division that may be present as a tumor or in a more diffuse state, such as leukemia. Um, so, you know, in the most basic sense, that's really what it is. It's just inappropriate cell division. Something went wrong, something went haywire somewhere, so now cells are dividing unchecked, um, and that leads to tumors, and eventually it could lead to death. So a mutated gene that induces cancer is referred to as an oncogene. Oncogenes are actually genes that are normally important for cell growth and maintenance, but have been mutated. Um, so, for example, from UV rays or from chemical mutagens, um, and they turn malignant. Malignant. So these are genes that everybody has. Um, they are important for normal functioning, but they are um, there are specific genes that are more likely to become oncogenes than other than others. Um, and a normally functioning gene is called a proto oncogene before it is converted into an oncogene. It's just the the nomenclature that's used. So every cell in your body is also equipped with tumor suppressor genes that code for proteins that survey the cell for abnormal growth and initiate apoptosis if necessary. Um, the protein P53, for example, is a product of a tumor suppressor gene that you may come across on the MCAT. Um, and P53 is actually pretty important in surveying the cell um, and activating apoptosis if there's no possible way that the cell can be repaired. Um, so high levels of P53 in a cell will activate apoptosis. Um, so apoptosis is a form of programmed cell death that's employed by the cell when there's no chance for repair. Um, it's quiet, it's controlled, and it seeks to minimize damage to the surrounding cells. So um, that's why we say it's programmed. Uh, if you compare it to other, you know, other types of cell death, say like um, necrosis or lysis, it's not as quiet and it's not as safe for the surrounding cells. So it can cause some damage to the tissue. Um, apoptosis, while it is cell death and it's a last resort, um, it is quiet, it is controlled, and it, it keeps the surrounding cells relatively safe. So the cell begins to shrink during apoptosis, and the cytoskeleton is disassembled, um, and the nuclear envelope is broken down. So the genome becomes fragmented throughout the cytoplasm, and the shrinking cell exposes new proteins on its outside to signal uh, to phagocytic cells to finish its degradation. So it basically, it sort of just becomes like a soup inside. Um, it loses the cytoskeleton, it loses its structure, um, and it sort of starts, um, it undergoes this process that's known as blebbing. Um, it, it sort of turns into these small little blebs that pop out, um, and eventually it forms these tiny, these uh, like little tiny bodies that we call apoptotic bodies. Um, and those, like we said, are going to express some uh, weird protein profiles on the outside, um, so the phagocytic cells can find them and finish degradation. Um, and then, you know, recycle anything that it can recycle and get rid of anything that it can't. Degradation inside the cell during apoptosis is carried out by enzymes known as caspases. Um, so they have a cysteine residue in their active site, um, and they cleave proteins at aspartic acid sites. So that's actually where the name came from, C as in cysteine, and then ASP, ASP as in aspartic acid. Um, so caspases are inactive until initiator caspases receive internal or external death signals. Um, so initiator caspases are the first 
sort of the first line that become activated during apoptosis. And they can then activate more initiator caspases and then effector caspases. So those are the ones that cleave cellular proteins and they trigger apoptosis. So like I said, that's my email. If you have any questions, um, you can definitely shoot me an email. I know this week was a pretty short video. Um, if you, you know, if you have some time, I really encourage you to go back to our 15 week program. Um, see if you can find some videos that maybe, you know, will go along with this. Cause remember this is a supplement course um, and it's meant to supplement our original 15 week. Um, we have office hours. We do them every week. Me, myself and uh, two other tutors do office hours. Um, you can use that Calendly link in the beginning to sign up. Um, if you want to be added to the group me, if you have any questions, again, please shoot me an email. Um, otherwise, I hope you guys have a great night and have fun studying.